All right, good morning, ladies. So uh, to avoid mistakes like yesterday and not turning on recording, I'm gonna put uh, Katie in charge of my life. Uh, she's always here every day, so she'll make sure I turn on my recording. So life will be great. <coughs> so uh, we'll start off with, let me share my screen here. So kind of a quick recap of what we talked about yesterday. So again, uh, yesterday we started chapter, uh, so all this had to do with chapter 12, so the newest chapter. Uh, so first things first, uh, again, sound is just a wave. Uh, so particularly in air, this thing has a speed, which is temperature dependent. So as we talked about yesterday, that temperature dependence is that this is 331 uh, times the square root, I knew how to write, there we go, of uh, 273 plus the temperature in degrees Celsius divided by 273. Again, the 273 is just to put it in Kelvin, uh, and that's in units of meters per second. Now, it's also a little more complicated than that. We didn't actually really talk about this because there's no actual formula for it, but it's not only temperature dependent, but it's dependent on other things as well. Uh, so for example, it's dependent on humidity. Uh, so that changes the density of the air. So it's dependent on the density of the air. Um, so other factors as well uh, are also dependent in there. But in general, this is the only one that we're gonna write down is the temperature dependent one. Uh, and again, what we perceive as loudness is basically the logarithm of the intensity. Uh, so that's what we call the decibels. So that's this line we're looking at here. Uh, so decibels, also known as sound level intensity. Uh, so that's equal to 10 decibels times the log of the intensity at a particular place in space uh, divided by what's known as the threshold of hearing. So again, the threshold of hearing, that is the minimum amount of sound of somebody of good hearing can actually observe. Uh, so the threshold of hearing, that is uh, 10 to the minus 12 watts per meter squared. So if I had an isotropic source, so I mean if I had say like a point source giving off sound, uh, that then goes off as a spherical wave. That spherical wave then moves away from the source with equal velocity in all directions. So that's this picture here. So my wave is moving in this direction with velocity in all different directions. So what that does is it creates these spherical waves. These spherical waves move out and then the intensity of the wave then is given as the power of the wave. So again, the power, that's what P is here. This is power. So power is the amount of energy per time, which is a constant. So this is constant for the wave but the intensity decreases because the amount of the wave that you are experiencing gets smaller and smaller and smaller the further and further you move out away from it. And so again, if I was standing here, then I'm gonna have a greater intensity because I'm sampling a much greater proportion of the area as opposed to if I was standing out here. Now the wave is much, much bigger, right? So now I'm sampling only a small amount of area. So in that case, it's the intensity then is the power divided by the surface area. That's what little a is here. So this is the power divided by four pi r squared because that's the surface area of a sphere. So surface area of the sphere is four pi r squared. So as we talked about this yesterday, so if I plotted the intensity versus distance, what happens in this case then is this falls off as one over r squared. So it looks something like this. Um, good, and then the last thing we talked about yesterday was going back to interference. So again, since sound is a wave, waves can interfere with each other. So again, we can create new waves by the interference between multiple waves. So in this case, let me try that, there we go. Uh, what will happen then is we can have constructive and destructive interference occurring at different locations in space. So this type of interference is a spatial interference. So this is interference at particular locations throughout space, but these locations do not move in time. So basically meaning that, again, if I had two sources, say one source is here and one source is here, if this location here is a point of constructive interference, this point will always be constructive interference. So even though the waves are moving, they're moving past each other. So meaning at one point, the move, wave moving from the left to the right, might go from a maximum to zero to a minimum and et cetera. So this thing is oscillating as it's moving, 
the one moving in the opposite direction is also oscillating, but it just happens that at that point, they're always out of phase by 180 degrees from each other. So these locations are interferences in space which happen at all times. So this does not move. These locations of constructive and say destructive interference at this point are always fixed in space. So they're never going to move. They're never gonna propagate around. So they're never gonna move from that location. So to define these locations, we talk about what's known as the path length difference. So the path length difference is then the difference between the length of path that the wave travels to get to that point. So if here's my source one, here's my source two, then D1 is the distance that the wave has traveled from the source to this point of interest. D2 then is the distance that this has traveled from source two to that same point. Then the path length difference then is the difference between those two paths. And if that is equal to an integer multiple of the wavelength, then we have constructive interference. And if it's equal to a half integer multiple of the wavelength, that's equal to destructive interference. So uh, one thing to note though, is this is only true if my sources start off in phase with each other. So meaning that both of these have exactly the same frequency. Right? So this one is giving off a frequency F, this one is also giving off the same frequency F, but those two have to start off in phase with each other. Now what happens is, uh, I'm just gonna talk about this briefly, but if the two sources are out of phase from each other initially, so for example, one is giving off at a crest and the other one is giving off at a trough, these two things actually switch from each other. So what'll actually happen then is I get constructive interference when they're a half integer multiple, and then I get destructive interference when it's a integer multiple of the wavelength. Uh, and the reason for that is because I have to switch because right, if I have one coming in at a crest and the other one coming in at a trough, I have to make sure that the one coming in at a trough gets shifted by half a wavelength to make sure that they're both coming in then at a crest to get constructive interference. So, so just note, uh, be a little bit careful with this. Uh, I think your book always does when they're in phase, but just note that if they are out of phase, these two things switch with each other. So let me write that in yellow. Hopefully we can see that. So if they are initially out of phase, Uh, then these switch. So just note that that is true here, okay? So I said, I don't think your book does that, but uh, I don't quite remember. There we go. So good, so this is what we talked about yesterday. So we wanna keep going with all this, right? So now we wanna keep talking about interference since we brought up interference. And the next interference that we talked about uh, in last chapter is standing waves. <laughs> so just to remind ourselves of standing waves, so previously in chapter 11, so this is what we saw in chapter 11. So in chapter 11, what we saw was standing waves which are created by uh, two fixed endpoints. So let's say, Examples of this were guitar strings, violins, cellos, pianos, basically anything that is a stringed instrument. So string instruments. So let's say here is my string. So I have a fixed end here and a fixed end here. So let's say this is the bridge and then the neck, right? And then this has a length of the string of L. So particular types of frequencies I can get are, for example, this one what we call n is equal to one or the fundamental. So here, this is vibrating at a half a wavelength. Right, so here, this is a half a wavelength. Uh, next one I can get is this one. So here I have one node. That's why this is called n is equal to one. This one has two nodes. So this is why it's n is equal to two or the second harmonic. This one is vibrating at exactly the frequency. Or I could have this one, which then has three nodes. So I have a node here, a node here, and a node here. So that's why it's n is equal to three or the third harmonic. And this one is exactly one and a half wavelengths or three halves of wavelength. And then et cetera. So the next one I can have would be n is equal to four, which would be two full wavelengths and et cetera. So as we talked about, what this means is, let me close the door because you can hear my daughter screaming. <clears throat> There we go. 
I don't know how she gets that much volume in her screams, but it's, it's quite impressive. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so as we talked about, what this means then is what? We can only have certain wavelengths which are allowed to exist on the string. So if I plucked my string, that means I can either have this wavelength or this wavelength or this one, but I can't have anything in between. So for example, I couldn't have three quarters of a wavelength on here, uh, or I couldn't have a quarter of a wavelength or anything like that, um, or five-eighths of a wavelength. I can only have these particular wavelengths. So this says then that the allowed wavelengths that I can have are lambda n is equal to 2L divided by n, where again, n is equal to an integer. So it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. These are the allowed wavelengths. And if the wavelengths are only allowed to have certain frequencies or certain wavelengths to them, that means I can only have then certain frequencies. So remembering that the velocity is equal to the wavelength times the frequency, that then says that the allowed frequencies are then equal to the velocity divided by the wavelength. Or using this wavelength here, that means the allowed frequencies are then equal to the harmonic times then the velocity divided by twice the length. So these are the allowed frequencies. So these are, of course, string instruments. These are ones that we have seen before. But of course, in music, we don't have just string instruments, but we have wind instruments as well. So the next one we're going to start looking at are wind instruments. So in wind instruments, we have two different types of wind instruments. We have what are known as unreeded, which are basically just open tubes. So examples of that would be like a flute. So an example would be a flute, where here you have just basically two open ends, where this thing has a length of L to it. Again, you have little holes in here, but you blow in through a hole, which is basically on the top. So you blow in through here, and then this has two open endpoints, or what we call two unfixed endpoints. So this is also two open. So this would be an example of an unreaded. So in this case, what has to be true is that the pressure at the end of the flute has to be the same thing as atmospheric pressure. So my pressure here must be atmospheric pressure. as well as on the other end. So this also has to be atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure. The other type is what's known as a reeded. So in this case, you have basically uh, what's known as a reed, which you blow into, which means in this case, you have a different pressure at the end, which has the reed. So an example of this would be something like a saxophone. And so if I thought about a saxophone, or I could use a clarinet, or a clarinet also has a reed to it. But basically, in this case, what you have is you have, say, something out here, which is the reed, which closes one endpoint, and then the other side is open then to the air. So again, at this side, we're going to have atmospheric pressure, because it's open to the air. Pressure. But on this side, we can have a different pressure. So this doesn't have to be atmospheric pressure. So this is uh, pressure different from atmospheric pressure. Okay. <clears throat> so basically what that does is it creates on this side a closed endpoint, or what we call a fixed endpoint, where on this side this is then open or unfixed. So we wanted to see now is how do we then create standing waves basically in these two different instruments. So let's draw a couple of these. So the first one we're going to look at is this guy. So let's do the unreaded ones first. So basically what happens is for the unreaded ones is you have to end on a pressure antinode. So what this means is you have to have an antinode on each side. So an antinode here and an antinode here. So remember, an antinode is where it has maximum amplitude. So for example, one thing I can have is I can have a pressure amplitude here and a pressure amplitude here, where this thing then is going to create a wave, which looks something like this. 
So this is what we call the n is equal to one. Right? This is our fundamental again. Or I could have, so again, here is my tube. So I can have, in this case, I could have like, a pressure antinode up here, but I can have a pressure antinode down below it so that this thing is going to go through, basically do something like this, and then go around like that. Right? So this is my n is equal to 2. This is my second harmonic. Or, again, we can have, again, here's my tube. So again, I have an antinode here, and I have an antinode on the top again. But in this case, I can also have an antinode in here. So actually, on the bottom. So this thing is going to do what? So I want one and a half wing waves. So this is going to do. I draw that right. Almost. It goes back up. There we go. <laughs> I've said it better. Don't mind my drawing. But this would be my n is equal to three or my third harmonic and etc. Now let's look at this case. <clears throat> so now if I'm looking at the redid one, now it has to be true on this side is what? This side is still going to be an antinode. So this is going to be a pressure antinode. But what has to happen on this side is this has to be a pressure node, which means that it has to stay at zero, pressure node. So in this case, I can have a pressure node here, a pressure anti-node, which would end up up here. So in this case, I can have this scenario. This guy just goes up to a maximum. So this would be my n is equal to one, or again, my fundamental. Or, I could have something like this. So here's my tube. So again, I can have a pressure node here, pressure antinode down here. But this thing is going to go up to a maximum and then down then to a minimum. Okay. Turns out this is actually n is equal to 3. Right? We don't have an even. So this is n is equal to 3. Uh, and then the next one we can have would be something like this. So again, a pressure node, pressure anti-node. And then this thing is going to go up and down and here and then up. Okay. So this then would be equal to n is equal to 5. Okay. Is okay? So, so let's talk about the wavelengths for each one of these. So let's go back to the unreaded. So for the unreaded, so notice that this one here, again, is simply just half of a wavelength, right? This one is starting off at its maximum, going through zero, down to the minimum, back up to maximum, which is actually just half a wavelength. And we can see that because if I go back to my previous page, it's the same thing as this guy, as this fundamental, just shifted by a half a wavelength, right? So if I took this, fundamental frequency here, and I shift it by half a wavelength so that this thing is now maximum here, ending at minimum here, we then have exactly this particular frequency. Okay. This one, this is also just simply a full wavelength instead of half a wavelength, which is also different from this and is equal to two by simply shifting this guy also by half a wavelength. This n is equal to 3 is exactly the same as this n is equal to 3, just shifted by half a wavelength. So the difference between having two fixed endpoints versus two unfixed endpoints is simply all we're doing is taking that wavelength and shifting everything by half a wavelength. That's it. Which basically means that what? All of these equations that I wrote down here are also true for the two unfixed endpoints. These are true for the fixed endpoints, and these are also true for the unfixed endpoints. So all of these revelations are exactly still the same. So that means for this guy, using black, that the allowed frequencies are also simply just equal to twice the length divided by the harmonic, and that the allowed frequencies is also equal to the harmonic times the velocity divided by twice the length, where n again is simply equal to an integer. One, two, three, four, and et cetera. Okay, so this is exactly the same. <clears throat> 
So this is true for both two fixed and two unfixed. These expressions are the same. Again, the only thing you're doing is shifting it by half a wavelength, but it doesn't change anything. Now for the one closed and one open or one fixed and one unfixed, or the readed instruments, it's no longer the same. These expressions don't work anymore. And the reason for that is as we can see here, because of the read, since we have to be at a pressure node at one side and a pressure anti-node at the other side, we can actually only fit quarter wavelengths in. So here we can see that this, since it starts off at zero and ends up at a maximum, that's actually equal to a quarter of a wavelength. So here we can fit a quarter wavelength inside of the length of the tube. For this one, it goes up through maximum, ends up at zero here, so this is a half a wavelength, but then goes down to maximum again, which is an extra quarter, so this is actually three quarters of a wavelength, is equal to the length of the tube. For this one, it goes through a full wavelength, but then goes an extra quarter, so this is actually five quarters of a wavelength, this equal to the length of the tube. So if I kept going, we would find a pattern where that pattern says then that the wavelength or the allowed wavelengths to go on the inside are then equal to four times the length of the tube divided by the harmonic. But in this case, the harmonic is only odd integers, not all integers. So for the case of the two open and two close, this is all integers. So one, two, three, four, five, all the way out to infinity. But for one closed and one open, we can now only have odd integers in instead. Now again, since the wavelength is discretized, that means we can only have discretized frequencies. That frequency then is going to be equal to the harmonic times the velocity divided by four times the length. But again, here we're only allowed to have odd harmonics, never any even harmonics. <laughs> OK? So this is standing waves then with sound, right? So with sound, we can still get standing waves when it comes to <coughs> uh, wind instruments. Again, for the two unfixed endpoints, it's exactly the same as the two fixed endpoints. The only difference is when I'm drawing the pictures, I'm shifting those pictures by half a wavelength. But the mathematics works exactly the same. So the allowed frequencies are still twice the length divided by the harmonic. And the frequency is still a harmonic times velocity divided by twice the length, where we have all possible harmonics. For a readed instrument, again, like a saxophone, clarinet, something like that, uh, we have a pressure node and a pressure anti-node. So in that case, we have the allowed frequencies, which are uh, the harmonic times the velocity divided by four times the length this time, and the allowed wavelengths are four times the length divided by the harmonic, where again, the harmonics are only odd. So these are our standing waves. Let's circle that too. Oops. There we go. These days I'll stop doing it. Okay. Green. Let's do green this time. Green. Go. Okay. So staying along the theme with interference. It turns out we can actually have interference not only in space, but we can have interference also in time. So let's talk about interference in time. Interference in time. It's called as temporal interference. And temporal interference. So temporal interference is at a fixed location in space, but the interference is occurring in a time-dependent fashion. Okay, so this is at a fixed location in space. But occurs in a time-dependent fashion. So how does this occur? So this is going to occur if I have, say, two sources. So this is source number one, and this is source number two. And I say sitting here at this location. So this is my fixed location in space. 
Now what happens in this case then is I have two sources, but the two sources have slightly different frequencies. So what'll happen is that this one is gonna have a frequency of F1, and this one is gonna be F2, but F1 is not gonna equal F2. So these two are gonna have slightly different frequencies. So what's gonna happen is this guy's gonna travel a certain path. This one is also gonna travel a certain path. So at this point, what's gonna happen is that these two waves are gonna interfere at this point. But since they have two different frequencies, what will end up happening is then that the way that the crests are coming in are slightly different from each other so that the amount of constructive versus destructive interference is changing as time is changing. Okay. So basically the, the constructive Constructive versus destructive interference. Oops. Interference is changing as time changes. Meaning this is happening as time varies from point to point. So <clears throat> To show you how this is actually going to work, uh, let me play you a quick video here. Usually I would bring these boxes in uh, into class, but I haven't been able to make it to USI, so we're going to have to do what we do. Okay. So, anyways, so basically what's happening here is that these are empty chambers. So basically, uh, if I turn it from the side, this is basically just an empty box where one side of it is open, the other side is closed, meaning that these are kind of a rated instrument. Right, so one side is closed, one side is open. And then basically what's gonna happen is that here, they have two different tuning forks with slightly different frequencies. Okay, so he's gonna play one tuning fork and then play the other tuning fork. What we wanna see is what happens when he plays both of these two tuning forks. So. So there's the first one. So he said that's 250 hertz. And then this one is 238 hertz. So, can everybody hear that? Hopefully, good, okay. So, Let's back it up just a second. So if you can hear it well enough, what you should hear is this kind of wobbling sound. So as you start playing the two tunes, So on top of the two frequencies, what you hear is this kind of whoop, 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 whoop type sound. And what that is, is that is the interference which is happening over time. So what this is, is what's called the modulation. And what it's doing is it is giving us a pattern that looks something like this. So what's happening is here I have two different frequencies. These two different frequencies are slightly different from each other. But what happens then is as I'm superimposing them on top of each other, as you can kind of see here, is at one moment, right, so here with this dotted line, the two waves are completely out of phase from each other. So as they're arriving at that particular point, they're completely out of phase, which then gives us totally destructive interference. But then as time is going on, the two waves are slowly going in phase with each other, which then gives us this fully constructive interference. So at this point in time, we have fully constructive interference. Then they're moving out of phase with each other until eventually at this dotted line, they again become out of phase with each other, which gives us destructive interference. And then that pattern just repeats itself. So the fact that they're slightly out of phase with each other gives us this, what we call modulation. So as you notice, is you have kind of two different frequencies going on. You have the overall frequency here, which is the difference here, the separation, but then you have this kind of packet which is known as the modulation, which is giving you that wobbling sound. So that's what's causing it to increase amplitude, decrease amplitude, increase, decrease, which is causing that wah, 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 wah type sound. Right? Now, beat frequencies are used a lot in things like music. Does anybody, any of you guys play music? Yeah. 
kind of. Katie, what do you play? Um, I played violin for about four years. Okay. Anybody else play any music? Trumpet. Trumpet? Okay. So when you tune, for example, if you buy a tuner or if you were in like an orchestra where you have the oboe play a particular note, to tune, what you're using is this beat frequency. So what happened is somebody plays a note, or if you have a tuner, that plays the notes at which you're supposed to be at. So for example, if you wanted to play a G, it would then play the tone for a G. Then when you strum your instrument, for example, to violin or guitar or whatever, what it's doing then is it's measuring the beat frequency between your actual tune versus the note at which is actually supposed to be played. Then by tightening your string, for example, if you're playing the violin, then you tighten the string or loosen the string to then change the tension. You're then changing the frequency and you're trying to make this beat frequency go to zero because the beat frequency is gonna go to zero when these two are at exactly the same frequency. So this is what we call a beat. Now beats are also used in other things as well. For example, in ultrasounds. So if you were trying to use an ultrasound to determine something like the velocity of a heartbeat of a fetus, something like that, you're actually using a beat frequency as well. So you're measuring the beat frequency, which has to do with a Doppler shift due to the fact that the object is moving. We're gonna talk about Doppler shift in a, in a little while. But, okay. So these are move, used in, again, music all the time. This is how you actually tune, uh, used in medical applications as well. Uh, beat frequencies are also used in things like sonar. So that's how you know you're approaching a rock if you're in a submarine and you can't actually see anything. Uh, so you're using basically beat frequencies that determine the velocity at which something is moving. So again, this is happening over time. So again, we're at a fixed location here. But again, that wobbling sound we're hearing is a time modulation or a time dependent interference as opposed to path length difference, which is a space or spatial interference. So what is a beat frequency then? So beat frequency, that modulation, so that packet, uh, which is what we call the beat frequency, is actually equal to the difference in these two frequencies. So we call the beat frequency then, the beat frequency is simply equal then to the difference of these two frequencies. So I'm gonna have to go back to the picture here. So this dashed line, which is kind of enveloping this uh, packet here. This is the beat frequency, and this is given by the difference between the frequencies of the two sources. This frequency, which is determined by the difference between these two peaks, uh, that one is actually equal to the average frequency. So that one, so the actual frequency is actually the average frequency, which is then equal to the sum of those two frequencies divided by two. Okay. So what we call our beat frequency is actually just equal to the difference in the two frequencies. So this is what's called the beat frequency. Okay. Uh, I'm not gonna do an example of beat frequency yet. I'm gonna save that for when we do Doppler effect, but. Uh, just note this is B frequency. So again, B frequency is the difference between the two frequencies, which is giving you this kind of wah, wah, wah type sound. Uh, it turns out as humans, uh, we cannot perceive a B frequency which is less than about 15 hertz. Okay. So for humans, uh, we can't perceive so less than or greater than? Sorry, greater than. Uh, perceive a beat frequency greater than about 15 hertz. So if we had a beat frequency which was greater than 15 hertz, our, hear, our ears would hear it. We wouldn't be able to perceive it. Uh, instruments could, of course, but we wouldn't be able to do that. Now, something else that's kind of interesting that'll happen in a situation like this. Um, so again, if I had these two kind of chambers here, uh, something else that'll kind of, that's interesting that'll happen, I'm gonna bring you guys down just a second, uh, is what's known as resonance. So I'm gonna let this guy talk about it a little bit, but, but let's say I have two boxes. Each one again has a closed side and then also has the open side. 
let's say I have a tuning fork, which is exactly the same on each one, right? So again, let me go back to this picture real quick. So notice what happens here when he hits the first one. Okay. Well, basically what happened is if you hit this first one, which was at 250, and then he stopped it, you would have nothing happening here. So nothing would actually happen with inside of this chamber. But notice what's actually happening is here, since this thing's vibrating, it causes the box to vibrate at exactly the same frequency, which sets up a standing wave inside of this chamber. That then sets up a standing wave inside of this chamber at exactly the same frequency as this guy. But since this tuning fork is different than this tuning fork, it doesn't cause this tuning fork to start to vibrate, okay? because they're at two different frequencies. But notice what happens here. Here again, when he hits this one, this causes again, the tuning fork to vibrate, which causes the box to vibrate, which causes the standing wave to happen inside of the chamber. That sets up another standing wave inside of this chamber. But since this tuning fork has exactly the same frequency as this tuning fork, it'll actually cause this tuning fork to start to vibrate. So let's check that out. If I hit one of these oh, forks, like I wanna hit this one, but I don't well, touch that one. You see this one sitting over here by itself. I hit that one, watch. Whoa! You see that? That one wasn't connected to this one. It's not touching at all. They're sitting on feet. They don't have any connection at all. But if I hit this one, the other one picks it up. Now, if I did it the other way around, if I hit this one, then that one picks it up. Now, if I do that, with one of these different forks, if I use E, I'm gonna get it here. If I hit the E, nobody picks it up. You understand what that means? We'll stop it there. So this is what we call resonance, okay? So what resonance means is that every object in nature has its own wave property to it, which means everything in nature has its own frequency at which it vibrates at. That's true for wood, metal, you, me, the earth, anything has its own vibrational frequency to it. Now what'll happen is, is if I can create a wave to pass through that object at exactly the same frequency at which that object wants to vibrate at naturally, what you'll do is you'll create what's known as a resonance. What the resonance does is it causes the object then to start vibrating at exactly that frequency as well which then causes the amplitude of vibration to massively increase. So again, I'm made up of atoms, I'm vibrating all the time, but if I send in a frequency at exactly the same frequency at which my body is vibrating at, then the amplitude of vibration is now going to massively increase. Now, this has some good benefits and it has some bad benefits. In things like physics, where you're looking for fundamental particles, where we do things that, like the LHC, which is the Large Hadron Collider, what you're trying to do is in, induce particles and you notice them by looking at their resonance. So you basically send in different energies at different frequencies and you're trying to induce a particular particle which exists at that particular frequency and then you can say, okay, this particle actually exists. But in nature, typically this has bad consequences. <laughs> so uh, here's an example of a bad consequence of resonance frequency. So this is the Tacoma Bridge. So basically what's happening is this is over the Tacoma Narrows and what's happening is you have a gale wind which is coming in. That gale wind then is actually causing the bridge to set up a resonance frequency. So basically the wind is coming through, mostly hitting off the river, going up, hitting the bottom of the bridge which is now causing the bridge to massively vibrate. So what's actually happening here is that the wind is then setting up a resonance frequency with inside of the bridge, which is causing this oscillation. So you can kind of see the, let me bring this up. I do break it, there we go. <clears throat> so you can see the resonance frequency going on here. Now what'll actually happen is, if it stays at a resonance frequency for too long, the amplitude becomes too big, and what you're eventually going to do is rip down the structure. Right. And we'll, we'll see that here in just a minute. 
and one poor guy is walking off the bridge. <laughs> kind of cracks me up. But that's fine. <clears throat> And there it goes. <clears throat> so basically, so again, what's happening is the wind which is coming through is sending up a frequency inside of the bridge. And then eventually the frequency matches the natural frequency or the natural vibrational frequency of the bridge, which then causes the bridge to come down. Okay, so it's setting up this resonance frequency. That resonance frequency is then equal to the natural frequency or the frequency this thing would naturally want to vibrate at, which ends up ripping the structure down. So typically, if you were designing something like the bridge here, now this was the first time this had ever happened, so they had no idea about resonance frequencies and things like this, uh, that this was possible uh, before the Tacoma Bridge here. <clears throat> but basically, when you're designing buildings or bridges or basically all kinds of different structures, then you have to try to create a you have to be aware of these resonance frequencies. So when something like an earthquake or heavy winds, so for example, you're talking about a skyscraper in New York City, winds blowing through, your skyscraper is basically gonna do this. So if your skyscraper then starts to vibrate at exactly the natural frequency of the building, that skyscraper is coming down, just like the bridge here. Uh, and if anybody's ever been in the military, uh, when you march in military, they always have you do cadence, which means that everybody has to march in step with everybody else. But when they go over bridges, they usually have everybody break cadence to basically avoid this resonance frequency because you don't want all your soldiers to basically die due to the fact that you ripped down the bridge by marching on it in the natural frequency of that actual bridge. So anyways, this is what's called resonance. So again, resonance is when you force a frequency inside of an object at exactly the same as the natural frequency, which then causes this object to, in this case, break or be a destructive force. But again, natural frequencies aren't always destructive, but, but sometimes they are. Okay, so this is natural frequencies. So good. I uh, just wanted to point that out. Uh, so next topic, which will be the last topic we're going to talk about in this chapter, uh, is what's known as, what I mentioned already, but the Doppler effect. So let's talk about the Doppler effect. So, anybody know what the Doppler effect is? It's okay if you don't. <laughs> well, I will let Dr. Sheldon Cooper tell you what the Doppler effect is. Right. <clears throat> Sheldon, there's something I want to talk to you about before we go to the party. I don't care if anybody gets it. I'm going as the Doppler effect. <laughs> No, it's not. If I have to, I can demonstrate. <laughs> Terrific. Uh, Hi. Hi. Hello. So what are you supposed to be? Me? I'll give you a hint. <laughs> Choo -choo train? Close. <laughs> a great damage choo choo train? <laughs> Anyways, that's enough of that. So the Doppler effect is the apparent shift in frequency due to motion. So this is what we call the Doppler effect. So the Doppler effect is the apparent shift in frequency, frequency, there we go, uh, due to motion. So this is what we call the Doppler effect. So as Sheldon was basically describing here, so we have the Doppler effect is when the object is moving towards you, what happens is the frequency is shifted upward, and then when it passes, the frequency gets shifted downward. So let's look at another example of this. Uh, so here what's gonna happen is there's a person in a car playing a trumpet, and they're gonna play one note in that trumpet, okay? 
So first we're gonna see it from the perspective of the car. So basically see that indeed he's playing a single note the entire time. Kind of an annoying note, but anyways, it's a note. So now we're going to do it from somebody at the side watching the car pass by and then watch the difference. So that's the Doppler effect. So notice as the car is approaching, it's at a much higher frequency. And then as soon as the car passes, now it's moving away from the observer, which in this case is the camera, and then the frequency drops. If any of you watch NASCAR or know anybody who watches NASCAR, you hear this all the time in NASCAR when the cars are zipping around the track and it's coming towards the camera. The engines are firing at a much higher frequency on the way towards it as opposed to when they're going away it then shifts downward. So this is what's called the Doppler effect. So again, the Doppler effect is the apparent shift in frequency due to the motion. Now, this will happen one of two ways. So either we can have uh, the object is moving, which we call the source is moving, which is what we saw in this particular example here. Uh, same thing with Sheldon. So he was doing for a moving source. The second way that this can happen is that the observer is moving. So the one who is witnessing the frequency can actually be moving and this will actually cause a Doppler shift as well. Or finally, we can have a combination of the two of these. So we can have both. But in general, this happens one of two ways. So either the source is gonna be moving or the observer is going to be moving. Or in the best case scenario, both are gonna be moving. So let's see how this actually happens. So here's kind of a simulation. So this is a spaceship. This is a Earth, looks more like Mars, but let's say it's Mars. And Mars is sending out a constant frequency to the uh, ship here. So basically the green in this case then is gonna be the wave crest. The yellow then is gonna be the wave troughs. So this thing is sending out a constant frequency at a a regular source time. So here, if I was in the rocket ship not moving, what you'll notice in this case then is what? The frequency stays fixed, so the interval of what he sees the frequency, or in this case the wavelength, stays exactly the same as the wavelength which is sent out by Mars. But if I give Mars some sort of velocity, so I let Mars then start to move towards the spaceship, see what happens in this case. So in this case, what happens then is what? The wavelengths now appear to decrease. So the size of the wavelength then starts to get smaller as this thing is actually now moving towards it. Then as it starts moving away, what happens then is that the wavelength now becomes much bigger or what we call the apparent wavelength due to the fact that it's now moving away from it. Now, let's do the opposite. So now in this case, I'm gonna let the observer move towards Mars. So in this case, what happens then again is that the wavelength is now going to become smaller due to the fact that he is now encountering each one of these wave crests at a quicker rate. So now he is seeing that they actually become much closer to each other. And then as he starts moving away, he's moving away from the source, which means it takes more time for the wavelengths to catch up to him, which means that to him, the wavelength at which Mars is sending out has now become much bigger. Okay. So this is basically what causes then the Doppler effect. So again, when the object is moving towards the, so when the source is moving towards the observer, the observer then is gonna encounter the frequencies much sooner than he should, or at least the wave crest much sooner, which causes him to think that the wavelengths are actually much closer together, which then changes the frequency. And then if he is stationary and the source is moving away from him, the opposite is true. Now what he thinks is that the wavelength is much greater due to the fact he's now encountering them as quickly as he should due to the motion of the source itself. 
Now, if we do again, this guy moving towards him. Now, again, he thinks that the wavelength is smaller because now he's in countering these wave crests much sooner due to the fact that he's running into them faster as he's actually approaching it. And then when he's moving away, he thinks that the wavelength has now become much greater due to the fact that he's moving away, so it takes more time for those wavelengths to actually catch up. Or we can have both. So in this case, it's just both things are actually happening. So now the apparent wavelength is becoming much smaller because it's moving and because he's moving towards it. And then as he's moving away, and the size of that wavelength, he just doesn't even measure it anymore if he's moving too fast away. Um, one other interesting thing that'll happen is if, let me take off a limit max speed, is if I take Mars here and I actually really crank up the velocity at which Mars is moving. So kind of watch what happens around Mars to the wavelengths in this case. So by the time he actually gives off an X pulse, he's way ahead of where it actually started, which creates actually this cone type shape. So if I reset that, and you actually can watch it here, so let's crank up the velocity. So each one that he gives off is actually behind where he's moving, which actually creates this cone. This cone is what's known as a shock wave. Let me talk about that before we move on and talk about the Doppler effect. So this is actually what's called a shock wave or sonic boom. And here, this is happening around a fighter jet. So for example, at an air show, these guys actually break the speed of sound. This creates this sonic boom or the shock wave basically around the airplane itself. So for an observer, if you were watching an air show, what you would see is the airplane go flying by. And then a few seconds later, you would hear this <laughs> as this thing passes you. So what that is, is that is the shock wave. So the shock wave happens when the object breaks the speed of sound. So in this case, the airplane is going over Mach 1. Mach 1 would be when it's moving at exactly the speed of sound. But it actually breaks the sound barrier. So what happens in that case is that the air molecules moving around the airplane are moving at a much faster rate than the speed of sound, which actually creates a pressure difference between the air molecules around the airplane versus those on the air itself. That pressure difference basically causes the air molecules around it to rip apart, which creates that sound. It's basically the same thing you create if you took a stick and you, you know, swing it real quick and you hear that whipping type sound. What happens in that case is that the end of the stick or a whip or something like that, whatever it is that you're swinging, is moving faster than the speed of sound. Since it's moving faster than the speed of sound, it rips apart the air molecules which are near the end of it, which causes that sound that you're hearing. So what you're hearing is from that pressure difference. The cone that's created here is actually an optical effect. And basically what it's doing is because the air molecules in the cone are moving at a different rate than what they're moving outside of the cone, it creates a dispersion of the light as it moves in. So the light comes in, gets dispersed inside of this region, which then causes the cone shape. So, so this cone is actually not physically there. It's actually an optical effect that you see being some distance away from it. Okay. But all of this has to do with the Doppler effect. So the Doppler effect, again, is if I took this object and I really increase its speed. So again, each one of these pulses it gives off is actually behind where it came from which creates this cone. So this is actually the shock wave. And again, this only happens when the object is moving faster than the speed of sound. If I put the limit on here and I let it go at exactly the speed of sound, what you'll notice in this case then is that all of the wave fronts end up building up on top of each other. So it's not moving exactly the speed of sound. But what'll happen is that when it moves at the speed of sound, the wavelength actually will end up going to zero. So that zero wavelength uh, <laughs> causes all of those waves to compound on top of each other as this thing is moving across. So good. So this is the Doppler effect. So let's talk about the Doppler effect. So how's the Doppler effect happen? So again, if here I've had a static source giving off some sort of frequency, say the sound of the engine as this thing is working to make the car go, so this would give off a regular frequency, which it would move in a spherical wave in with a velocity in all directions, so move equally in all directions. But what happens then is as the object starts to move, 
by the time it gives off wave, one wave pulse to the time it gives off the second wave pulse, the vehicle is also moved, which then causes the wavelength in the front here, which we call the apparent wavelength, to decrease in size. So again, this thing is giving off pulses. Those pulses are moving as spherical waves outward. But by the time it gives off one pulse and then the second pulse, the car itself has moved further. So the difference between the wave crest on the side at which it's moving to has now decreased. So we call that distance the apparent wavelength. So <clears throat> let's analyze this a little bit. So let's look at what happens for a moving source. So let's say here's my source. This thing is moving in this direction with a velocity v of source. And then we have our wave, which is moving outward. So I'm going to draw the wave moving in this direction, where the wave, in this case, is moving at the speed of sound. Okay. So basically what happened is if I'm on this side, so let's say I'm watching from over here, what I'm going to see is that but I get one pulse here and then another pulse here, where these two things are separated by what we're going to call the apparent wavelength lambda prime. Versus if I was standing back here, I'm going to see one pulse here, and then the second pulse is going to be some distance further away, which we're going to call lambda double prime, which is the apparent wavelength on this side. Now, let's talk about it on this side. So on this side, <coughs> what do we do? So on this side, what we can say then is that the apparent wavelength, lambda prime, is then equal to the speed of sound times a period, because the amount of time it takes for this wave here and this wave here to both be at crest, the amount of time here is the period, minus then the speed of the source times the period, right? Because my source has moved from this location here to this location here, also in the time of a period. So initially, when the car was, say, sitting here, that corresponds to this wave pulse. But by the time it moves to this location, that corresponds to this wave pulse. Okay. Now, they're both moving the time of the period. So let's factor out the period. So this becomes the speed of sound minus then the speed of the source, all times the period. But we know the period is equal to 1 over the frequency. So this is going to be the same thing then as the speed of sound plus, or sorry, minus. Work with me. There we go. There we go. So minus the speed of the source, all then divided by the frequency. Now, <clears throat> the apparent wavelength here is going to be equal to what? So remember that the speed of sound is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. So in this case, this is going to be equal to then what? The speed of sound divided by the apparent frequency. Because we have the apparent wavelength, so it's going to be divided by the apparent frequency. So let's solve this for the apparent frequency. So that says that the apparent frequency then is going to be equal to the actual frequency, because this is the actual frequency at which it is at. <laughs> is then going to be equal to what? So I'm basically just shifting these guys. So this is going to be equal to the speed of sound divided by the speed of sound minus the speed of the source. So this is the apparent frequency when my source is moving toward an ob observer. So this is then toward the observer. On this side, it's basically going to be the same thing. We have that the apparent frequency then is going to be equal to the speed of sound times the period plus the speed of the source times the period, which means this is going to be the speed of sound plus the speed of the source, all divided by the frequency, which is then equal to the speed of sound divided by the apparent frequency which means the apparent frequency then is going to be equal to the actual frequency times the speed of sound divided by the speed of sound plus the speed of the source. So this is then the apparent frequency when the object is moving away from the observer. So notice the difference between the two is this negative sign. So when it's moving toward, this negative sign then means that this denominator becomes smaller as the denominator, oops, that shouldn't be a prime there. 
Uh, there we go. Sorry about that. So as the denominator gets smaller, what that does is it creates a greater number here. So you're taking the frequency, multiplying by a bigger number, which then increases the size of the frequency, as it should. Over here, this plus sign is then increasing the size of the denominator, which then decreases the size of this number. So then you're taking the frequency, multiplying by a smaller number, which then decreases the size of the frequency. So in this case, what we know is that the apparent frequency then is greater than the actual frequency. And on this side, the apparent frequency is less than the frequency. So as it's moving toward, frequency shifts up, moves away, the frequency shifts down. What happens if the soar or the observer is moving? So let's look at a moving observer. So in this case, let's say here's my source. This thing is giving off wave pulses. So here's my one. Here is my other one. Okay. These two things are separated by a wavelength. But in this case, let's say I have my observer moving in this direction with the observer. And again, my wave is moving away at the speed of sound. So my wave is moving in all directions with the sound. The sound the sound, <laughs> but again, my observer is now moving towards my source in this case. So basically what happens in this case is that the frequency that this guy measures is again gonna be equal to now what's known as the apparent velocity divided by the wavelength, okay? So what's happening is as my observer is moving towards the source, what he appears is that the velocity of the source is coming at him faster than what it should be. Right? So think about if you're driving in a car, right? And so if you were standing on the side of the road and somebody's driving at you at 60 miles an hour, you would say they're driving at 60 miles an hour. But if you were running towards them and they were driving towards you at 60, so let's say you're running towards them at 15 miles an hour and they're driving towards you at 60 miles an hour, what you would think then is that they're actually moving at 75 miles per hour. So you would actually sum your two velocities together. So the fact that this guy is actually moving towards the source, what he thinks is that the wave itself is actually moving at a much faster rate, which is then equal to the speed of sound plus the speed at which he is moving. So the speed of the observer divided by the wavelength. Good. And this is equal to, sorry, the apparent frequency. Now the wavelength we know is related to the speed of sound. So this is gonna be equal to the actual frequency times the speed of sound plus the speed of the observer divided by the speed of sound. So this is then the apparent frequency when the observer is moving toward the source. Now if I was on this side and I was an observer moving away from the source at a speed observer, what happens in this case then is since I'm moving away, I'm gonna have an, again an apparent velocity, but that apparent velocity then is gonna be the difference between the two velocities. What I'm gonna think is that the wave is moving at, towards me at a much slower rate. So this is gonna be equal to the speed of sound minus the speed of the observer divided by the wavelength, which is then equal to the actual frequency times the speed of sound minus the speed of the observer divided by the speed of sound. This is then the apparent wavelength when the observer is moving away from the source. So another same thing here. Here, since the numerator is getting bigger, that makes this number bigger. So I'm gonna take the frequency, multiply by a bigger number. So in this case, then the apparent frequency is gonna be greater than the actual frequency. In this case, when it's moving away, since the Numerator has gotten smaller, that makes a smaller number here, which then means that the apparent frequency is then less than the actual frequency. Okay. Now, in the most general sense, we can put all of these things together. And what this says then is that the apparent frequency is equal to the actual frequency times the speed of sound, speed observer, divided by the speed of sound, speed of source 
And the way we're going to write this then is two different positive and negative signs. So this one is going to be, and let me put these in green. So I'm going to write this one with a plus and a minus. And then the other one in red, minus, plus. Okay. So both the green ones here correspond to when the object is moving toward. So both of these are toward. And then the red ones correspond to away. Okay. So this beautiful expression is finally what's known as the Doppler effect. So the Doppler effect we write as the combination of both the observer and the source which are moving, where again the upper signs here or the green signs both correspond to when it's moving toward. So in this case the observer is moving towards the source and the source is moving towards the observer. And the red sign is, or the bottom signs are when they're moving away. So this is when the observer is moving away from the source and the source is moving away from the observer. Now, in a general problem, you can have a different combination of these, right? So for example, one can be moving toward while the other one is moving away. Good example of that would be you're being chased by a cop car. So you're trying to be pulled over. In that case, the police car is chasing you, but you're trying to get away from the cop car. So the cop car is moving towards you. You're moving away from the cop car. So in that case, you just have to know which one of the signs are you using. Are you using the positive sign or the negative sign? But that's going to be based off the physical situation on what is actually happening in these cases. Okay. So as an example of that, uh, let's do our first example which is we have a police car moving at 80 meters per second, chases a speeding car, which is moving at 45 meters per second, in the same direction at which the police car is going. So in this case, the police car is moving toward the speeding car, but the speeding car is moving away from the police car. The siren on the police car is at 80 hertz, so we want to know what is the apparent frequency heard by the speeding car. So let's do our example. So let's draw. So here's my police car. Has a frequency. That frequency is 80, 800 hertz. Okay. My police car is moving in this direction. So let's call that the police car moving at 80 meters per second. And here is my speeding car moving away from the police car in the same direction. So this is my the car is moving at 45 meters per second. Okay. So what we want to know then is what is the apparent frequency heard by the speeding car? So what does he hear? What is the frequency that he hears from that police car? Okay. So let's get our notation. So in this case, the velocity of the police car is equal to the velocity of the source, right? So the police car is what's giving off the frequency. So that's going to be the source. And the velocity of the car is the velocity of the observer because he's the one that's actually going to be hearing it. Okay. Uh, the other thing we need to know is what is the velocity in air? Uh, of course, I didn't write that down. So let's, let's assume that the speed of sound in air in this case is 340 meters per second. That's going to be our speed of sound. So good. So all we want to know in this case then is what is the apparent frequency heard by the speeding car? So in this case, we know that the apparent frequency is going to be equal to the actual frequency times the speed of sound, speed of car, divided by the speed of sound, speed of police car. So now we just have to determine what are our signs, right? So what signs are actually happening in each one of these different cases? So to do that, we just physically look at each one of the different objects and then determine what is it doing relative to the other one, okay? So for example, in this case, the car, we know the car is moving away from the police car. So in this case, according to what we wrote up here, when it's moving away, we're gonna take the red sign, which then would correspond to the negative sign, right? So in this case, since the car is moving away from the police car, so car moving away from police, then that corresponds to the negative sign. However, the source, the police car, is moving toward the 
observer in this case. So it's moving towards the observer that would correspond to the top sign or the green sign, which would correspond then also to the negative sign. So down here, we also get a negative sign. And this is because the police is moving toward car, which in this case, again, corresponds to the negative sign. <clears throat> so for both of these, then we would simply then use the negative sign, right? So again, in this case, the car is moving away from the source. So it gives us a negative sign, but the source is simultaneously moving toward the observer. So that also gives them the negative sign. So good. So this means then that our parent frequency is then equal to the 800 hertz from the original frequency times the speed of sound, which is then the 340 minus the speed of the observer, which is then 45, divided by the speed of sound, which again is 340, minus then the speed of the source, which is then 80. So, <coughs> oops, go away, Siri. So assuming I'm using the correct velocity, which you never know, uh, that should give us a frequency of about 906.46. So 906.46 hertz. So this is then our apparent frequency. So the car then here is a higher frequency because ultimately the police car is still moving towards him at a faster rate than he is moving away. So since police car is gaining up on him, he's going to hear a higher frequency because it's still moving towards him. If he was moving at the 80, so he was moving away faster than the police car was approaching him, then the opposite would be true. So if overall he was moving away, he would hear a lower frequency. So this thing would be dipped down. So in that case, if he was moving at the 80, but the police car is moving at the 40, then this would be lower instead. Everything's okay? So we have one more example, but we don't have enough time to do it. So we only got about two more minutes left. Uh, so we'll save that one for tomorrow. Uh, so tomorrow, then we will do one more example, uh, tidy up some things, and then we will do a review, uh, basically for everything that we talked about coming up for the exam. Uh, we'll also talk about the structure of the exam. So basically, what does it look like? What to expect? Uh, how many parts are there? How many questions? Things like that. Um, and then basically I'll have for the rest of the time, basically just group assignments. Okay. So basically you'll just be working on, uh, something which deals with Doppler shifts and beat frequencies. Uh, so actually you're going to look at ultrasounds. So that's what we're going to be playing with tomorrow. Um, so we'll do that for the rest of tomorrow, Friday, then we'll probably start the next portion. So we'll start electricity, uh, basically on Friday. So that we'll have the exam on Monday and then we'll continue with electricity then on Tuesday. So, everyone's okay? Any questions at this stage? Doing pretty good? Not too bad? Okay, good. So that's it. So we'll do one more example tomorrow. That example will have both Doppler and beats. So we'll actually be able to see beat frequency used in a question as well. <laughs> and uh, yeah. And then, like I said, we'll spend the rest of the time kind of talking about the group assignments and then kind of working on those. So, all right. So if there's no questions and everybody's doing okay, then, uh, then we'll break and then meet for lab in about 15 minutes. And remember, Katie, you're responsible for me from every day now. Make sure I turn on the <laughs> on that record sign. Okay. <laughs> so let me stop sharing and yeah, we'll go from there. Okay. So otherwise, I'll see everybody in lab. <laughs>